Good evening and uh, welcome to this fringe event in the context of this year's virtual rendition, well, actually the second virtual rendition of the Leeds International Medieval Congress. Um, please note um, that this session is being recorded. Uh, tonight we'll talk about historical catastrophe studies, a rapidly evolving and highly interdisciplinary field of historical research and the series of the same name that was launched early this year with the publication of volume one on earthquakes and historical seismology. Um, my name is uh, Robert Fork. I'm an acquisitions editor for medieval and early modern studies at the Greuter, and I'm exceedingly happy not that uh, not only two authors with upcoming volumes in this series, Katrin Klemann, uh, University of Freiburg and Peter Brown at Nijmegen and Durham, uh, but also two of um, the three series editors, Christian Rohr and uh, Dominique Collet, Christian Rohr from uh, Bern University and Dominique Collet from the University of Oslo, accepted our invitation um, to this roundtable. And then we're also thrilled that you, uh, the members of the audience, joined us tonight, especially because we also want to hear from you what you think about studying historical disasters, the potentials of this approach, um, possibly even about projects of your own. Um, and we'll start with a round of brief, pretty informal presentations from our speakers um, to hear from their perspective on the subject and to some extent, of course, also the series. And, you know, while our speakers may want to react directly to each other's presentation right after uh, they've talked, and the floor will soon be opened uh, to uh, general discussion. Um, and as a member of the audience, please post your questions into the chat and I, then I can either read them out or uh, read the question out or uh, uh, unmute you so that you can post it yourself. Christian, Christian Roy, I think you wanted to because you know you you were basically the uh, sort of the first one that uh, Elizabeth Kempf, another uh, colleague of mine, contacted and um, came up with this wonderful idea to found that series. Uh, I think it would make sense uh, for you to to start up uh, around uh, yeah brief remarks. Yeah, thank you very thank much you. For, for this kind introduction and hello everybody. And thank you for joining this roundtable. My name is Christian Rohr, and uh, many of you may know me from, from former IMC conferences. I'm a very frequent visitor here. And so as I just looked here, it was, I think, uh, 13 out of 20 of the last 20 years. And looking back to the IMCs, what, what hasn't uh, happened now uh, during the last two years, there is one thing I really appreciated very, very much that was the book fairs. So all of you have ever been to the IMC uh, uh, on site, you, you have seen the book fairs and this is really a very fascinating place. And uh, going back three years in 2018, I was just, uh, uh, stumbling in and, and went to the, the Greuther uh, um, table because uh, fortunately there was a book of mine on display on water in the Middle Ages and I just uh, had a talk with Elizabeth Kempf and uh, what she did was something like a scholarly indecent proposal. That means um, she asked me what about installing a series on historical catastrophe studies. And yeah, it was really an indecent proposal because on the one hand, I knew that will cause additional workload, but on the other hand, it's still a desideratum. And therefore, yeah, I, I checked some things and I also had to check uh, who could also join the editorial board. And then I found uh, Dominic Colle, who is with us today and uh, Chris Gerard, who is uh, absent you uh, to work on site of uh, his archaeological excavations. But uh, yeah, we found a very uh, interesting uh, concept together uh, for this series. And, and I think it's really a very important issue because when I started working on uh, natural disasters just about 20 years ago, that was at the 
beginning of what is called Habilitation in, in the German speaking countries, second book, uh, this was still a very exotic topic uh, in general history and in particular for, for medievalists. So uh, there were some studies on early modern times, but for medieval studies, there were only a very few number of uh, articles, but no uh, general concept of, of disaster studies and so on and so on. And so this series could uh, enable uh, to publish not only monographs, but also edited volumes. And what was very important for our concept that it should be interdisciplinary. So uh, no matter if you come from uh, archeology, span from history, from art history, maybe from uh, theology or whatever, uh, or coming also from the, from the natural sciences, but uh, having, um, uh, target audience also in the humanities. So this uh, was was the main task of, of this series. And uh, uh, we are very, very open to different approaches uh, from antiquity to contemporary times. So a wide range, both in approaches and in uh, the times uh, that could be included into the series. And also the audience should be as broad as possible. And, Looking now at our program, so volume one has already been published earlier this year by Konrad Schelbach. Uh, it's um, on medieval uh, earthquakes. Uh, Peter, who will then just present his project himself, uh, is working on medieval archaeology. Katrin uh, is just uh, combining uh, geology, uh, volcanology, and uh, discourse analysis uh, in a typical historical sense. So uh, this makes this series really a very, very important and uh, a challenging thing also for us editors. And I'm very, very happy that we are now here. And um, I think I hand over now to either Dominic or Peter. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'll just give a very brief overview of um, the volume that I'm authoring. Um, the, aim, the aim of my book is to explore the different responses of populations to weather-related natural disasters in medieval Britain. And to do that, I'm using both historical and archaeological uh, or material evidence. Um, I'm approaching this through the framework of David Alexander's dis disaster cycle, which conceptualizes disasters as a constantly repeating uh, cycle with phases such as the emergency phase, that's the, the, the actual moment of disaster when catastrophe strikes, um, the restoration stage, uh, that's the immediate aftermath when, when things, uh, people sort of get themselves back together and start to work out what to do now, now that this great change has taken place. The recovery phase in the longer term when people sort of carry out repairs and might think about why the disaster actually happened and what steps they might take to prevent something like that happening in the future. The quiescence phase, which is the sort of gaps of time when less happens, but maybe that's something we can debate. Um, and then the pre-impact phase, which is the sort of build up to the next disaster. Uh, for medieval people, I would argue that that phase was not so important because they didn't have sort of accurate forecasting of weather, that kind of thing, to um, allow them to predict with any certainty uh, that a disaster might occur. Um, in the book, I look at a number of case studies in detail, including a, a series of 13th century coastal storm surge floods, uh, which struck southeast England. Uh, as well as an extreme windstorm that damaged a huge number of structures and felled a great number of trees across southern England in the 14th century. Um, I trace these events through both the historical evidence and also material and archaeological traces, such as uh, phases of damage and repair in standing structures like churches and bridges. And by bringing all of these different strands of evidence together, I think it's possible to uh, build a detailed picture of how these events unfolded as disasters and, and what happened in the aftermath. Um, one of the key themes of my research is that although medieval people are often uh, painted as sort of um, completely backward and totally unable to comprehend the cause and effect of complex natural processes like natural disasters, um, and yeah, I've been like completely 
uh, willing to simply attribute everything to divine action. I, I think there's actually quite a lot of evidence that uh, they had highly nuanced understanding of of these kinds of um, of risks posed by some environmental hazards, at least. And we we can see, for example, in the embanking of um, embanking and draining of wetland landscapes. Um, Although these flood defences were, were sometimes broken down um, by the sea, uh, the infrastructure is often quite uh, complicated and a lot of planning and scale obviously went into the construction of, of these structures. Um, maybe there was quite a lot of guesswork um, compared to modern construction. Um, they didn't have reliable ways to model the strength of structures or how natural forces would affect them. So they had to learn mainly through trial and error. Um, we can see this in, in bridge building, uh, which slowly developed uh, over time towards stronger and more resilient bridges, and maybe also church spires, which gradually become more aerodynamic and, and better able to withstand high wind speeds over the course of the medieval period. Um, where medieval people didn't fully understand uh, the hazard that they were dealing with, um, and they didn't have a reliable way to guard against its impacts, um, medieval people did have um, their own sort of set of responses uh, to fill that gap. Um, and, and these were sort of what we would now consider supersti superstitious or, or religious methods. And I, I'm exploring these through both the historical and the archeological evidence uh, to look at things like um, material culture related to um, pilgrimage or the cults of the saints, uh, folding coins, uh, which was connected to making a, a vow with a saint for protection. And not always to do with natural disasters, but uh, I'm sort of looking at this as evidence for how people protect themselves generally, including against uh, disasters. Uh, there's other things like uh, graffiti, and uh, which often has a ritual element to about protecting a building perhaps, um, and also textual amulets, sort of uh, documents that people believed uh, if they carried them on their person, they would protect them from certain hazards, including the things that we would now term disasters. Um, yeah, so wh while we might think of these as like s a slightly ridiculous uh, method of protecting yourself against a natural disaster. For medieval people, they were a totally rational response and they filled the gaps in what we could, uh, in what could be achieved practically uh, in, in an age when scientific and technical understanding of hazards was yeah, compared to today, relatively poorly understood. And, and we have to remember that across medieval Europe, um, Christian teachings touched almost every aspect of life and people learned about the saints and, and Bible stories through a very wide range of media throughout their entire lives. So it was in some way natural for them to seek, um, to seek help through this avenue um, when, when there wasn't an obvious practical solution. Uh, so, so in my book, I'm sort of um, exploring the two sides of the coin of the, the practical and the um, more superstitious and religious responses. And I tried to bring all of these strands together to give a relatively complete account of how meteorological hazards were perceived in medieval Britain and the wide range of responses that people adopted in their aftermath. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Now that uh... Shall we just continue with the, the second project? So that we have the um, comparison uh, right there. Um, yes, hello everybody. And um, thank you for having me. My book, A Misconnection and Environmental History of the Lackey Eruption of 1783 and its Legacy will appear later this year within the Historical Catastrophe Studies series. So I'm very glad to be able to tell you about my upcoming book today. This is actually the first time the public is seeing this cover, so that's very exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, as the title suggests, my book studies the Lackey eruption that took place in Iceland between 1783 and 1784 um, from the perspective of environmental history, the history of science, disaster studies, and geology with an interdisciplinary approach. Um, the Lackey eruption is in many ways extraordinary. This volcanic eruption was, called, was not caused by a cone-shaped volcano, which is what you might imagine when you think of a volcano, but instead it was caused by a fissure that over the course of its eight months long eruption reached a length of 27 kilometers. 
This fissure released the largest volume of lava produced by any volcano on planet Earth during the last millennium. The volume released was almost 15 cubic kilometers, which equals about 5.8 million Olympic-sized swimming pools, just so you have an idea. Um, this volume of lava covered an area of about 600 square kilometers. This is slightly larger than the city of Leeds, which is 551 square kilometers. In Iceland, this volcanic eruption and its aftermath are still remembered as the country's wor worst disaster. Although nobody died as a direct consequence of the lava flows, the ash and gases that were released by this eruption poisoned the fields and meadows, which in turn poisoned the animals. Malnutrition, malnutrition diseases and eventually famine, the so-called famine of the mist, followed. A fifth of the Icelandic population perished, around 10,000 people. Volcanism does not respect political borders. Some volcanic eruptions, if strong enough, have hemispherical or global consequences. In June 1783, within days of the start of this eruption, contemporaries in many parts of Europe witnessed a strange dry fog, blood red sunsets and sunrises, some even experienced a sulfuric smell. However, while the strange dry fog dominated much of Europe for weeks and months, the people in Europe were oblivious as to the cause of this unusual weather. Hence the title of my book, Mist Connection. It was a mist connection between the dry fog and the eruption in Iceland for everybody except the Icelanders. Although news of the eruption arrived in Denmark and the rest of Europe in early September 1783, by this time the dry fog had largely become yesterday's news and an Icelandic volcanic eruption as a culprit remained only one theory among many. Inspired by the Enlightenment, several theories as to the origin of this weather were in circulation. Relative to those volcanic eruptions that had occurred earlier, such as during medieval times, for example, we are reasonably well versed in the chronology of this 1783 eruption. From the perspective of climate history, it's a luxury to know the exact start and end days of an eruption. The sources show that one event can be interpreted differently in different regions or even by different authors within the same region. While well, some remark upon the dry fog as such, others call it smoke or focus on the smell instead. Consequences of volcanic eruptions include uh, withered vegetation, blood red suns, respiratory problems, sore throats, stinging eyes, or volcanic cooling. Historians of other periods, such as yourselves, maybe in the audience, um, can look uh, out for some, or for one or more of these um, effects in your respective sources. I hope reading my book will help historians to sharpen their eyes to the potential consequences of volcanic eruptions that you can find in your sources. Even if, like in 1783, the contemporaries were in the dark about the true nature of the unusual weather they might be experiencing. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Um, so there was a little bit of a, uh, yeah, we had uh, difficulties uh, with uh, Dominic Clay joining. So I, th I don't think, Dominic, that you've actually heard what Christian was saying, but he uh, um, sort of uh, spoke, uh, well, of course, about the discipline and also about the, the indecent proposal that a colleague of mine uh, made at one uh, IMC in Leeds. Um, to, yeah, to uh, strike a deal and uh, found this series. Um, but you wanna um, sort of, uh, after also hearing, you know, some, again, something about those projects that you also know uh, about your personal approach or like take on catastrophe studies and uh, yeah, uh, on the series as well. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, uh, sorry for joining a little later. It's of course only fitting that uh, I had some technical disasters for a, a session like this, but I can assure you that the uh, book production actually goes uh, a lot more smoothly than this might suggest. And um, I know Christian very well, so I can imagine what he 
might have uh, introduced you with uh, in connection to the series. A few words maybe about myself as a co-editor. I'm of course honored um, and very pleased to have all these really promising um, uh, research projects coming in. Um, I um, came to disaster history in a kind of uh, conversion experience, I have to say. I wrote my first book on the practices of collecting in the early modern world, something that is very elite um, and very, um, you know, detached maybe from the fate of the other of the 99%. And then I felt like I had to do something that actually covers the rest of the population and um, started working on the Little Ice Age that starts in medieval times and, um, and encompasses the early modern era and famines in particular. Uh, and of course, these are total experiences. They cover all er areas of the societies. They also um, ask us to, to um, use all kinds of disciplines uh, to cover them. Uh, history on its own is basically, um, you know, uh, maybe too limited approach. That's something that the history of disaster tells us. And uh, so for the last 10 years or so, I have been working uh, in this field uh, of the history of disaster and uh, environmental histories in particular. And I'm now a professor for environmental and climate history at the University of Oslo. And um, during those um, kind of 10 years that I've worked with this uh, field, I took away three messages I wanted to share. Uh, one is, of course, that uh, disasters are still, um, I guess, and Christian probably knows this um, a bit better than me, having a slightly larger involvement with the field, but it's still kind of uh, not necessarily mainstream history in a way. Um, in many cases, the disasters are actually the missing pages of history. And uh, many um, historians have in the past treated disasters as something that relates to the larger histories, um, similarly as uh, bank robberies relate to the history of banking. You know, they happen, these disasters, but they don't have a, a long-term effect necessarily. Uh, and then history goes on. But of course, I feel that they provide us with unique opportunities. They're probably the closest thing that we have as humanities scholars to do experiments um, on, on a living society, so to say, that goes its normal pathways and follows its structures. And then suddenly you can apply pressure uh, through a disaster like this. And then what you get is a reveal of all those hidden conflicts and asymmetries and perceptions and fault lines that people will probably in normal situations not necessarily talk about and that are so difficult to trace. So I think it's a great opportunity for historians. There's also plentiful sources, um, even for medievalists. I probably don't have to tell you during this conference, you will have met plenty of them. You can look at uh, chronicles and account books and uh, trade reports and wills and church books, and you will find disasters everywhere. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's there for the taking. So for one thing, um, I think doing a history of disaster and publishing it in this, in this series is simply good history. It helps us to understand history better and it's to, to have a richer picture. The second aspect though, is that I also think it is very current, right? Uh, we, when I started, I felt that maybe disasters is something that happens to past societies and we are safe and secure and we have, antibiotics and technologies, but of course we still uh, encounter disasters all the time. Um, and the technologies that we have made to help us safeguard against disaster can also shape new ones like this current pandemic that is probably you know, accelerated by our technology of flying and transportation and spreads much quicker um, than earlier pandemics could have done. Or of course the current heat dome phenomenon in North America or up here in Scandinavia, actually, um, which is something that is partially man-made and accelerated by our own uh, involvement. So I think whenever these things happen, uh, the, the nice kind of German expression, orientational knowledge is, is needed. And that is probably what Christian and, and me have experienced uh, all the time. Now that we have a current pandemic and I have 
worked a little bit on previous epidemics and also previous vaccination campaigns, you get a lot of interest of people that immediately want to know what did we do the last time? How did we sort this out? How do we go back to normal after an experience like this? And I think that is certainly something that we can contribute, but that we also have to contribute because we now know, of course, that just numbers and statistics and 2% and an R rate of 1.7 doesn't necessarily induce behavioral change for the people to actually come to grasp what this means. They need uh, to have lived experiences, not just mathematical numbers. And that is something that we can certainly contribute. Um, and of course, that disaster is such a constant phenomenon uh, also makes comparisons particularly uh, viable. And the third thing I think is that what we're dabbling with here in this book series and with our research projects is part of what you would probably uh, now call Anthropocenic studies, right? I mean, they remind us that society and nature are intricately connected in very many ways. And the um, kind of common uses of the phrase natural disasters, of course, doesn't bear out in reality at all. What we see is, of course, that every natural disaster is also a societal uh, catastrophe and that there are numerous connections to explore here. And when we have the debate about the, the short Anthropocene, the kind of 1950s modernism that has uh, catapulted us into a new world, then we as historians can, of course, qualify this a little bit and look at the longer roots of these problems that we have with um, entangling and disentangling uh, these strands that lead us inevitably um, to disaster uh, occasionally. So I think there is lots of merit in this series, both for our own his, uh, discipline and uh, our own dealings, but also to kind of reach out and engage with the larger debates. And I'm really looking forward uh, to your questions now and maybe also to your projects um, and I hope that this series will contribute a little bit to to broaden the debate from maybe more technology centered approaches to something that is more uh, that is richer maybe and more uh, social natural uh, in a sense okay thank you well, so I think there was a great deal to uh, in those presentations to think about. And please, so if, like for anyone in the audience, um, uh, please, you know, maybe this is a good moment to to maybe think about questions. Do uh, type them into the chat, and then I can sort of, and I can, I, I, as I said, I can either read them or you know, or unmute you so that you can ask um, your question yourself. But maybe there are. Uh, um, uh, among the four of you, there are like immediate responses to what uh, you've said. You, you all know each other to you know to various ex um, extents, and I, I have a lot of things now, a lot of uh, um, questions in my mind. But maybe there is something that you really wanted to uh, mention after hearing this in a fresh uh, from a fresh perspective now. I. I have a question maybe maybe to Katrin, because I, I mentioned that I, you know, one of the things that I found particularly interesting in covering disaster is that it's a it's a total history. It's something that needs cooperation, probably more than many other fields that uh, also work with more specialized approaches. You've worked on volcanoes and you mentioned the geologists. Uh, maybe you can tell us a few kind of sentences on, on how you um, experienced this sort of challenging big interdisciplinarity um, that disasters also kind of force on us, but also reward us with. Yeah, it was a really interesting experience. So um, my background is in history. And um, when I joined the Rachel Carson Center at LMU Munich, I was actually encouraged to take up geology as my minor. So I actually sat in geology classes um, with bachelor students who were just starting, starting up. And I went on several field trips and um, I bought my geological hammer and helmet. And it was just really interesting to um, immerse myself into this field and to learn so much. And I think it has really helped me to understand volcanoes from a truly different perspective, not just from my historical sources, but also from 
um, to really deep dive into the into the literature um, that exists. And I could um, I actually started this book 130 million years ago with the formation of the Iceland mantle plume. So that's slightly earlier than um, most history projects start. So um, that had really helped me to understand also how unique the Laki eruption is because it's something that only happens every 200 to 500 years. So it's really unique. And um, the last comparable event um, that happened in Iceland actually occurred during medieval time. That's the Elkia eruption in the 10th century. And that happened almost like throughout the time when Iceland was being settled. So um, yeah, I'm sure it had been forgotten by the time um, the Laki eruption occurred. Like Icelanders were familiar with so many different kinds of eruptions, but not necessarily uh, flood lava events on, on the scale. Um, so that was that was really interesting. And it also helped me on so many other levels in throughout my book project. Um, for example, it, I encountered a lot of earthquakes um, that contemporaries felt or imagined um, throughout the summer of 1783. And having this background in geology really helped me to understand um, where earthquakes are actually likely and where they probably did not occur. Um, and yeah, it was also amazing to go through to go to these conferences with um, paleoclimatologists, dendrochronologists, um, ice core people, and to learn about their methods and to also understand the strengths, but also the weaknesses of these methods um, to like, yeah, to be able to really understand them and assess them properly. Um, so it's been a really, really eye opening experience and I I'm a very big proponent of interdisciplinarity. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm quite interested to see how the reactions will be because, of course, we are publishing big books here, right? I mean, we are. Uh, it's the long form uh, that we're kind of uh, still practicing, and very often what we, you know, we are told is that scientists don't read, don't read books. But I have a very different, different experience. I mean, I. Uh, you know, I got a lot of reactions also from the scientific colleagues because they they often feel that they're missing out on those narratives that we can spin. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm. I would like in you know once the books are out, Peter's and Catherine's books, and uh, the next ones in the series, I'm really looking forward to see um, if they are not filling also a gap within the science community where they feel that their you know very high specialization is sometimes missing the storytelling aspect of um, of engaging with disaster. Yeah, I could, could also uh, add for this aspect. Um, we are all now publishing in, in, in two directions so that the one thing is, is just in this scientific journals, uh, natural scientific journals, and they have a very, very strict way how to publish both uh, how to structure the article and, and also uh, concerning the length and as a historian or a, um, someone coming from cultural or social studies in general, uh, this is very, very hard to do because you have to tell much more and, and there, there are narratives to deal with and so on and so on. And, and this is only possible with, within a book. On the other hand, uh, just opening such a series to um, to natural scientists and to show uh, that is the way how we are working and and there is also something they can benefit from that. Um, when when I just published my my habilitation and it was a book of 640 pages, uh, one of my uh, closest colleagues from natural sciences asked me, "Oh, how could this book uh, be scientific to write?" Uh, 600 pages of your own. So, so this is something how, how natural scientists think. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, in, in humanities, this is something you have to prove to, 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 to get your doctorate degree or to, as the second book, uh, maybe, maybe for a professorial career and so on and so on. So uh, I think it needs both uh, uh, the scientific journals, uh, or also humanities journals, and on the other hand, uh, the book series, just enabling the authors to uh, broaden their, their their views and and also to uh, 
um, to follow a narrative on, on, let's say, 200, 300, even 400 pages. And I think that's, that's very, very important, not only to, to think in, in, in an article length of 10, 15 pages. Again, so also like for anyone in the audience, don't be shy or you can, if you don't want to write it into the chat, you can also, I think, uh, raise your hand if you want to. Um, otherwise, uh, for, for, for the moment, I'll just uh, use the opportunity. This is something maybe, you know, for, for all four, four of us, for all four of you, although I think many of the questions and things that came to my mind before and were already answered, or at least to some extent uh, uh, talked about. Um, and uh, what really came, became clear is what great um, a subject disasters are to study because they, they can tell us so many things. Um, so, and, and you, you can approach them from so many angles, but in you view, this, this, you know, anyone could and of, of you could answer, what are the, major problems, maybe the methodological problems when, yeah, studying disasters. So what is, what are, in, uh, what were the difficulties you ran into uh, methodologically or, I mean, you know, um, in, in, in uh, like inter with the interaction of uh, um, scientific data, if you can call it that. So maybe one thing I, I could just add to this question is, um, uh, when you're doing disaster history or climate history in general, uh, there is one big, big uh, concern. This is uh, determinism. And we are facing that also uh, in the current discussion on climate change, on, on uh, what is related to climate change directly, what is influenced by climate change, and so on and so on. And I think what we have to do, and that's also something why you need the books to write, uh, to be written, uh, is just to tell in length that it is, uh, in many cases, a very complex situation. Why do um, people think or act in this or that way? And uh, uh, just looking at the, at the forthcoming books, this is, uh, I think, one of the key issues to show uh, there are so many factors to be considered. And uh, on the other hand, if you're looking uh, what, uh, for instance, media expects for, from us, from, from the disaster historians, is just telling, oh, this is a disaster. And therefore, uh, we know once again, this is, this is just a sign of climate change or, or whatever, or uh, it is a sign of, uh, let's say, a medieval warm period, or it's, uh, Whatever. So, so in this way, we have to be very, very cautious. Uh, on the one hand, it makes us less uh, um, interesting, maybe for 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 media, because sometimes media only wants the sensational news. And on the other hand, uh, as, as scholars, we have to be uh, more precise. We have to be more reflected on our topics, and so. Uh, climate and disaster determinism is, is uh, maybe one of the, the biggest issues uh, uh, in current society. And, and we have to be strong and say, uh, no, I don't want to do uh, something for the media only to have maybe a catastrophic uh, announcement, but just stay stay with the, with the facts uh, you are working on. Yeah. If I can add to that, um, sort of related is uh, a methodological issue that um, people sort of get carried away with disasters. And um, if there's a sort of notion that a disaster might have happened somewhere, uh, they, they, like historians and archaeologists in the past, they, they, they always link something to the disaster that they know about. Uh, and it's not always the case that the, there is actually a link and you have to be quite careful about uh, treating such uh, cases uh, critically to to assess whether the, their person actually uh, had any basis for the, for the connection, or, or if it's just a sort of folklore that that grew up around the connection between whatever it is and and the disaster. Yeah, this is 
probably departing a little from from the question we were giving, uh, but uh, I also see this as a uh, a praise for the long form um, that we kind of cultivate in this in this series that you can um, have the space for multifactorial issues for the complexities and the pluralities and I think it can be absolutely liberating uh, to have this uh, uh, somewhere because the the um, you know the the force that a, a 20 page article uh, has in in um, limiting your argument also can make us very passive right determinism makes us passive if we have uh, you know one effect uh, and uh, one cause and one effect then there's very little interplay for us to actually take our fate in our own hands but when we look at the complexities that we can maybe co uh, cover in a in a book form then i think we can make a much better point that there is actually room for us right to influence our fates to kind of uh, react this way or the other way to have more opportunities than just building a higher dam uh, or having the next techno fix um that is, I think, something we we want to contribute here and that needs to have a space, right? When the people ask themselves what happened in the last pandemic, they weren't looking at a scientific paper of 10 page length uh, that gives you something on the, I don't know, the spike proteins. They want to, to have a, a story that is being told about, you know, what the, um, the great flu pandemic, for example, or the, the, the Black Death pandemic kind of change in society. And you need to have the space and opportunity to, to kind of unfold the story with all its potential. So it gives us, gives us opportunities rather than just telling us that's going to happen. I think that is one of the interesting aspects of still kind of cultivating this, um, this book format. Maybe, maybe one, one little remark on that. Uh, uh, this is a, a series on historical catastrophe studies. Uh, and so catastrophe is a, is a very wide uh, field. So it's not only natural disasters, but it could be also disasters like, like epidemics, like pandemics as we have it, or also a long-term uh, crisis that lead to a disaster, for instance. So, um, we are very open now for, for, for different approaches. And so if you, uh, as a maybe future author of, of this series, uh, are not um, very sure, is, my, is this maybe the, the, the right series for you to publish? Uh, just get in contact with us. And, and I, I think we can check that very quickly. And also if, if the, the, the other surrounding conditions are acceptable for you so so in, in this way uh just come to us and and maybe maybe you even do not know how how important this this book uh, you want to publish is for for us and for our series and and also for for the greater publishers in general yeah The, the things that uh, all of you have been saying, um, there's another there's another thought that came to my mind, um, also in terms of uh, well, the of course the because then you've just mentioned that disasters don't have just don't just have to be natural disasters, but somehow sort of the net sort of the natural environment. Of course, and, and interacting with it, reacting to uh, these events plays a big role there and then this is of course sort of the one big interesting um aspect about the, the, or one of the big interesting aspects that disaster studies they bridge this uh, um what bridge if you will the gap between the natural sciences and the humanities so there is an interesting um they offer a way to uh, bring those two uh, fields together, which seems so far apart, and that and I'm um, sometimes asking myself whether sort of that is why catastrophe studies may be sort of an avenue towards also a new paradigm within or a, like a, a new step of development w within the humanities, because they um, in that way they learn uh, 
you know, go beyond what we've uh, been, uh, what, what we've known about cultural studies and uh, the prime primacy of text and all that. That is one thing. But then on the other hand, uh, what Dominic was saying about the the long form, and that I was asking myself whether, yeah, uh, catastrophes. I mean, there's also something, right? They uh, disasters they feature in historiography as well, right? Because they uh, it's something that you that lends itself to structure a narration to to talk about. It's something that you you you, you it's often difficult to wrap your head around, but you you do try in textual forms. Um, so um, yeah, that's an, uh, another way uh, to um, well, to put it is from a remark into um, a proper question. In what sense is it are disasters that, um, a, re a, a very, very, very good subject just because it sort of makes you tell a story, uh, allows you to really write a history? Um, and um, can it bring the humanities closer to the you know approaches of the natural sciences? Oh, sorry, it was a little big. <laughs> you don't have to answer this. Is, I was also like, um, yeah. Music if, I, if I can yeah, respond yeah. to that, um, uh, I think we're we're already second generation uh, disaster historians, so to say, in the sense that we are kind of, you know, um, uh, using that in our in our very own work. Of course, that we're not just kind of trying to figure out the facts of what happened, but also the ways they are perceived coped with and then remembered and told because that is just as much uh, part of, of what a disaster is, um, you know, from uh, not just kind of retelling the facts, but also the way that people try to make sense of this. So I think it's, all, it's already part of our narrative, but I think there, there is a, a larger point, as you mentioned, that um, I hope that this series can also contribute a little on, on finding a new vocabulary here um, to, to cross those bridges to the sciences, because right now it's often a one-way street, right? We, we are co-opting uh, concepts from the ecologies, uh, for example, like uh, collapse or vulnerabilities or resilience or fragility or persistence, stress, um, and these are often concepts that are systemic uh, in their nature and that, that carry quite a bit of cultural baggage also with them. And I think we, we can be translators here also and, and test uh, where we can find common ground to find, find an avenue to um, integrate our studies in, into the um, much larger, I think, non-historical <laughs> disaster research that is also out there, um, but not uncritically, of course. Something like collapse, for example, which is often associated with disaster is a term that can be very problematic. I get it all the time. Of course, you have the collapse of the, the, the Maya civilization that is happening over, you know, depending on what researcher you study, three or 400 years. Is that still a collapse? I mean, it's obviously too long for any living person to, to realize what is happening, um, you know, in a, in a larger picture at the time or resilience that that has this aspect of going back to a status quo of returning to a formal normal, which for any historian is, is really quite complicated because we don't think that way, right? We think we can never go back once something happens, you know, the, the, um, the civilization is forever changed. We have these memories and experiences. So finding uh, potential ways of talking to each other and understanding the same thing, something that is, you know, flexible enough to work uh, as a boundary object, but that is also rigid enough to to make us understand each other is also something that we will be dabbling with. Uh, I guess once the books by Peter and Catherine are out, we can see how they tackle this challenge. Both of them work um, with uh, the sciences and um, across the disciplines. So I think that's also something that is difficult sometimes to just do in a short paper. Because it, you know, these these vocabularies that we need to foster this cooperation, they also need the space to unfold and to be critically evaluated and see what they bring us in addition of just talking as historians do of change or you know acceleration or 
something uh, similar, but uh, to talk of um, stressors and collapses and, and systems. If I may add to that, um, from my perspective, from my work with the volcano community, I think it's also more than just a one-way street. Um, I mean, obviously, we as historians are profiting from, from the work they are doing, but um, on the other hand, uh, our work has also needed our work with the sources to narrow down timescales of you know plus minus five years. That's quite a lot if you look at um, at historical sources, and if if they <laughs> the national scientists work with us as um, humanity scholars, we might be able to actually help them to narrow this down a bit further and um, yeah to offer this um, human perspective, the societal response perspective. Um, I think that's also something very valuable that we're adding to the discourse there. So maybe once again to the audience, uh, do you have any questions? Maybe so, so looking at your names, I, I know that some of you are working on, on, on disasters uh, for a couple of years. So if you are really interested in, in, in contacting us, just do it and you can do it now here also in a very informal way and, and maybe this could be a starting point of a very good cooperation. So don't be shy once again. Um, so again, uh, please uh, do continue to think about a question if you, if you would like one to, would like to ask one, but maybe in the same vein of what you was just saying, Christian, um, are there any that now also looking even at the the books that have been published in or the book that's been published in the series that are already forthcoming with lots and lots of very like different topics earthquakes volcanic eruptions i think there's also a book on flooding um being um prepared meteorological disasters of various kinds are there any specific disasters that you think any one of you are understudied or would be, you know, particularly fitting as, you know, you would like to see somehow within the series? Well, there's there's obviously the, the large area of non-European events uh, that should probably receive a lot more attention, but that are also methodologically maybe challenging. Um, I also think that... Um, comparative approaches is something that would be valuable um, and we all know how difficult it can be to just reconstruct one fascinating disaster in all its um, uh, plurality but um, comparing those maybe um, even across time or across regions I think would be a, a very valuable approach um, and then in terms of content I think you know, there's there's maybe more to be had than than the classics, the the short, rapid disasters. There's also the slow onset disasters, um, and maybe the as Anthony Oliver Smith has called it, the kind of 500 year earthquake, right? That happens in two hours, but has a very long uh, history that pre pre shadows or prefigures what's happening. So um, I guess that even though we have some fascinating uh, research in the last couple of years and, and still coming up in the series, all those fields merit a lot of attention. And I think I, I would also like to see something, not just because of the current pandemic, but to kind of uh, to, to also engage where we, with the medical um, health uh, or life sciences more than just with the natural sciences, I think could also be very valuable. I know that it's not necessarily easy uh, for those people to, to work with us because they have different funding way, uh, avenues. Um, but I, I think there is a lot to be had in, in uh, medical humanities and, uh, and, and environmental humanities as well. Maybe I could add some uh, some topics or approaches within the inside uh, the humanities as well. So this is uh, the arts. So for instance, uh, literary studies, art history, and so on and so on. I think uh, they are just in, in its, the infancy of, of 
studying natural disasters. Uh, and I think there's quite a big potential in, in the visual representation, in the literary representation of, of disasters of all kinds, of epidemics, of, of natural disasters, and so on and so on. So I, I think, uh, in particular for, for, for the pre-modern times, I think this is, this is really a very large field uh, for, for further studies, but also for, for, for the 19th and 20th century or even 21st century. Um, uh, another topic could be um, architecture. Um, uh, I think uh, we, we heard a bit on, on on um, adaptation strategies, and and I think just uh, looking at architecture, that that could be also very uh, important field uh, to be included. Uh, mostly, it's included then then in an interdisciplinary way, maybe from the archaeological side or from from uh, uh, town history or, or whatever. So, so I think uh, just be creative and 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 come to us for. Or for your proposals, yeah. All right. So we've been. Uh, it's so far. Been, it's been a fantastic discussion of, of uh, one hour, and but <laughs> one. Yeah, I, I guess sort of uh, uh, sort of the sort of the last. Uh, uh, opportunity also to again uh, um, like for the people in the audience to you know if you if you want to comment on something just uh, you know something that you found interesting or if there's anything you'd like to add to uh, those uh, great points that have been made. Um, That's a question. Uh, by you yes. So I think Mariko, you should be able to speak now. Can I speak now? Um, yes, yeah. you're here. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> and thank you so much for this very yeah, wonderful uh, book series that you're launching. And I'm very excited about it because as some of you may know me, I just finished my dissertation on disaster prevention in Japan, where I look at prevention strategies uh, in a long-term perspective from the late 19th century to the 1970s. Um, so um, I have a bit of a question. Um, uh, uh, Dominic uh, um, mentioned that maybe what about the non-European perspective? And what I was a bit wondering is, um, and my question would be, why is the book series called Historical Catastrophe Studies? Because um, it, it kind of occurred to me that catastrophe might be more like a continental European word to describe disasters mostly. So I was just wondering um, if there is like a um, focus on European perceptions of the disasters or what were the ideas be behind choosing this name? Because obviously <laughs> I'm, I'm looking from a non-European as you say in, in, in the German um, system, this also europäische Geschichte, non-European history. So what uh, would be your um, approach to, to include non-European perspectives as well? Yeah, I think you're totally right that, that perceptions as a disaster or as a catastrophe, uh, this is a very European approach on the one hand, but on the other hand, if you look, for instance, at uh, Greg Bankoff's book, Cultures of Disaster on, on the Philippines. Uh, I think it's, uh, it shows what, what we were discussing on, on, on the terminology just, just given by the, the social sciences, given by, by the natural sciences. So, so we have to, uh, to deal with that in our series also to, to, to strengthen uh, maybe a new terminology and maybe um, contributions from, from non-European areas in the world uh, could foster this uh, discussion and so on and so on. So for us, it, it was something like um, uh, easily understandable um, um, name of the, of the series. Uh, and of course, uh, the main audience is, is mostly the Western world, so still, so, so of course we would like to be 
um, recognized also in Eastern Asia, in, in South America or wherever, but, but still most of, of research is, is, uh, is, is done in, in, in Europe and in Northern America and, and therefore uh, maybe, maybe catastrophe studies would be a, a fancy title, so we thought, but, but still you're co completely right that what is a catastrophe and, and is it really applicable to, to, to other regions in the world? I think that could be a, a really important topic within this series. Yeah. You have, of course, caught us out there um, now that I've uh, asked everybody else to kind of reflect on, on uh, critically uh, on, on the vocabulary we use. You're perfectly right, but I think there's there's also a very pragmatic reason for this, and that was that there is quite a few other series without a historical outlook that already occupy the terminology, so we had to come up with something that isn't already taken. Um, but I think uh, I, I speak for the other editors as well, saying that we are absolutely open to have um, studies that focus on the non-European world. Um, because I, as I've just said, I think that is one of the of the great um, kind of uh, gaps in in historical disaster studies. So that is certainly something we, we would consider. Uh, we're probably not uh, the best, uh, let's say, publishing house for Japanese language publishing, but uh, I, as long as it is um, um, in, in a language that we can actually, that we use, and that is, I think, so far German and, and English, in the series, then that's that's perfectly uh, within what we envision for this series. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> just um, just being curious about the naming, and um, of course, also looking for opportunities there. Of course. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Any other questions in the audience? Mark, we, I, I should use that the guide to publishers is a publisher both situated in, in Germany and uh, in the US. So uh, publications both in German and English are very welcome. Uh, and what is also very important for us is, is that we have an open access strategy. Uh, so uh, many of the um, National science uh, foundations, they, 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 they even prescribe that, that the publications coming out of projects funded by them, they have to be also published in open access. So, so we are uh, working hard to, to enable any of those publications to be published also open access. So this could be also interesting for you. Absolutely, it can only under line this um, and I will just um, share this uh, screen with you very briefly um, for anyone st still attending that of course what naturally uh, if you have a project if you're interested in this um, publishing the series of course uh, you can get in touch with uh, the series editors in pers um, personally, or if you want to, or just again, like uh, discuss you know, publication policies and oh, what uh, Cassino just mentioned, open access. Um, my colleague Elizabeth Kemp is actually sort of the man the the uh, editor at our press managing the series. Like most of, most of all, you can of course you know um, um, ask me as well. We're both uh, focusing on medieval and early modern. Um, studies but uh, do uh, frequent sort of uh, uh, voyages also in other uh, periods. Um, so yeah, uh, do not hesitate to uh, get in touch with us. And if you're attending the conference, the IMC, uh, uh, have a look at our booth. So even there, they, they have a talking, uh, they can even uh, get in touch with us there, have a chat uh, in that context as well. Um, excellent. Um, yeah, if there are no, other, I mean, if there are no further questions, I think um, we're ready to slowly wrap it up. So, but, you know, if there's any the last comment or anything that, uh, 
or um, Katrin, Peter, Christian, Dominic, do you want to add anything else? Otherwise, I think it was a, um, yeah, it was a fun discussion. And I really, really thank you for uh, yeah, agreeing to meet with me here and talk about uh, the research that you do. And I think, uh, and thanks uh, to the audience as well for joining and um, the question uh, as well that's been asked. Yeah, thank you. And again, hopefully, um, I do hope to, um, uh, yeah, to, to see you in some capacity, either as an author or an editor or in, in another discussion. Again, thanks so much. Thank you very much on my side as well. And